move on to the next uh, speaker. Uh, Dr. Priya Jamidar is a professor of uh, medicine at Yale and uh, a nationally known uh, gastroenterology physician. is chief of endoscopy uh, at uh, Yale University, uh, longtime friend and colleague. And uh, he is uh, kind enough to come here and, uh, and ba to Balmy, Rochester and yeah. in January. Uh, and he's going to give some uh, very interesting insights into his personal and professional uh, experience with this disease. And, uh, you know, uh, we are very grateful for your time, uh, for accepting this invitation, and for coming over here. So welcome, Priya. Well, thank you. Thanks to uh, Lori Perez, um, Pancreatic Cancer Association of Western New York, and Vivek Call for having me here. It's, uh, it's a lot warmer than I thought it would be, so. <laughs> so uh, I work at Yale New Haven Hospital, and this is the Smilo Cancer Center, where uh, the GI lab is located. Uh, these are my two partners, is James Farrell, who is actually involved in the CAP study that Dr. Call was alluding to, the, can the pancreatic cancer prevention uh, screening study. And this is Harry S. Lanian, who is, uh, um, does a lot of endoscopic ultrasound and uh, um, also very interested in pancreatic cancer research. So uh, where is the pancreas? Well, the pancreas is it's kind of in the shape of a fish. It's about the size of a pear, six inches and it sits behind the stomach and the spine. So it can be divided into the head, body, and tail. Um, the pancreas is really surrounded by a lot of important anatomy. You uh, uh, have the two vessels, the two big vessels, the superior mesenteric vein, the superior mesenteric artery, and if you have a tumor that involves its vessels, that makes a tumor unresectable. Uh, again, it's divided in the head, body, and tail. It sits in this cradle here in the second portion of the duodenum. The portal vein and the bile duct um, drains the liver and it goes through the head of the pancreas and into the uh, small intestine. And bile is required for digestion of uh, proteins and fats. So, um, and I know most of you are familiar with all this, but pancreatic cancer is the ninth and tenth most common cancer diagnosis in women and men. It's actually currently the fourth leading, leading cause of cancer-related death in this country, and it's on track to be the second leading cancer-related, uh, uh, second leading cause of cancer death in 2020. Um, so there's about 45,000 new cases a year. It's, you, this cancer is unique in that the incidence is almost the same as the mortality from cancer. And as Dr. Call was mentioning, most people from pancreatic cancer, virtually all of them from pancreatic cancer, and I'm talking really uh, focusing on adenocarcinoma of the pancreas, not the neuroendocrine tumor, which has a better prognosis. So most, of, most people, unfortunately, succumb to this disease. The five-year survival is dismal. It's gone from 2 to 6% six, 6 over the past 40 years. Um, and only 10 to 20% of patients with pancreatic cancer have resectable tumors at the time of diagnosis. The average lifetime risk of developing pancreatic cancer is 1 in 67 or 1.5%. Uh, pancreatic cancer is uh, common in African Americans. Um, typically, it's pretty rare to get pancreatic cancer under the age of 45. Uh, the average age of diagnosis is 71. Um, um, what are the risk factors for pancreatic cancer? Well, you can divide them into two groups, the modifiable risk factors and the non-modifiable risk factors. And I know some of this has been just discussed, but there's repeating, so cigarette smoking uh, uh, doubles the risk of pancreatic cancer. So smoking really is uh, bad, and it can be easily, not easily, but it can be uh, modifiable. Obesity, a high intake of animal fat, occupational exposure, and some other conditions. The non-modifiable risks, the age, it's a disease of advancing age. Uh, sex is commoner in men than female, positive family history, and chronic pancreatitis. So uh, what can you do to lower the risk of pancreatic cancer? Well, uh, get, your, get into an ideal body weight, maintain, maintain your BMI below 25, uh, quit or don't smoke cigarettes, regular exercise, daily physical activity, ensure adequate sunlight exposure to increase vitamin D levels. This is probably pretty difficult to do in Rochester, but <laughs> you can take vitamin D. 
uh, avoid a uh, diet high, anim high in animal fat diet, uh, drink moderately or not at all, and consume fresh foods rich in antioxidants. Um, how do you diagnose pancreatic cancer? Well, there's a, a variety of uh, uh, imaging techniques you can use. You can use uh, CT scanning or MRI. Uh, most of our patients will ultimately end up having an endoscopic ultrasound. Um, and this is a uh, procedure where an endoscope is passed down into the second portion of the duodenum adjacent to the pancreas. Sound waves are used to locate the tumor and a needle is passed through the scope and into the tumor and a sample is obtained. This is called fine needle aspiration. Um, and here's an uh, endoscopic uh, ultrasound showing the needle going into, into a tumor, into, into the head of the pancreas, and here are the cancer cells. So uh, most pancreatic cancer is found in the head of the pancreas, about 80%. And these patients typically present with jaundice, pain, and weight loss. Uh, typically, the typical patient has these symptoms for days to weeks. Uh, it's very difficult to cure cancers, cancers in this area because they usually present after their jaundice, and typically the tumor is quite large at the time of, uh, quite advanced at the time of diagnosis. Uh, body and tail cancers are rarer. These patients have a much worse prognosis. They present typically with weight loss and pain, and they have symptoms for months. Because they're not jaundiced and they have vague, annoying abdominal pain and, and you know, varying degrees of weight loss, it's difficult to, to make this diagnosis. I mean, typically, it's not made until months later. Um, you can stage pancreatic cancer in several ways. This is probably the simplest way of staging. So stage one disease is when the tumor is confined to the pancreas. Stage two disease is when it may have spread to nearby organs. And this can be divided into stage 2A and stage 2B. Stage 2B is when it spreads to the lymph nodes. Um, stage 3 disease uh, is when the cancer is spread to the major blood vessels near the pancreas. And they may also have spread to the nearby lymph nodes. And stage 4 disease is when it's spread beyond the pancreas to organs such as the liver, lungs, and the peritoneal cavity. Um, so as been mentioned repeatedly, now only 10 to 20% of patients are resectable at the time of diagnosis. Um, and about a quarter to a third of patients have locally advanced disease. Uh, the vast majority of patients develop metastatic disease within the first year. Uh, in fact, there's a school of thought uh, that basically uh, subscribes to the notion that pancreatic cancer is not a localized disease, it's a systemic disease. And there are micrometastases or there's spread or micro very small levels of spread at the time of diagnosis in virtually everyone. Um, and how do you treat pancreatic cancer? With stage one and stage two disease, uh, currently um, will undergo surgery and surgery will hopefully curative resection. A few patients in stage three are operable. Um, we see a lot of stage three patients who, and um, what we try and do is treat them with neoadjuvant therapy, usually chemotherapy to try and shrink the tumor and downsize it and this will hopefully make them surgically resectable a few months later. Um, um, patients with uh, um, pancreatic cancer are also treated with radiation. I think this is, the benefits here are unclear. Um, it may help in controlling local symptoms, but again, I think a lot of, you know, it's mainly a systemic disease, especially advanced cancer. Uh, chemotherapy, I know you have some experts here who will be dealing with this in, in much more detail, much more knowledgeable than I about this, but, but generally the, Mainstream in the past has been a, a medication called gemcitabine. Uh, more recently, fulfurinox, which is a combination of these uh, four medications, uh, was introduced. Uh, this was uh, a, a study that was published in the Journal of Medicine, and the survival dramatically jumped in patients with metastatic pancreatic cancer to a mean of, from a mean of about seven months to 11.1 .1 months. I mean, this has been a lot of progress, but it really isn't great. I mean, they really lived a year instead of six months. Uh, the one-year survival in these patients was almost 50% versus 20% with gemcitabine. Uh, more recently, gemibraxane uh, was introduced and the response rate was 48% with a 12.2 month overall survival. So these are statistically significant uh, gains and improvements. Um, 
But really, I think we're really a long way away from really getting a satisfactory result with uh, certainly with advanced pancreatic cancer. <laughs> um, so this is an interesting slide. We made a lot of progress in other cancers over the last 30 to 40 years. But in terms of pancreatic cancer, the survival rate has gone from 2 to 6%. Lungs, 15%. Colon and rectum is 65%. This is five-year survival. Breast is 90%, and prostate's 100%. So really lagging behind. I think the funding has been miserable for pancreatic cancer. As uh, Dr. Call said, the NIH funding is uh, about $100 million uh, with a multi-billion dollar budget. Um, pancreatic cancer, I think the, the future is early detection. And pancreatic cancer is a silent disease. Frequently, no symptoms in the early stages. This is usually diagnosed when the disease is advanced. Um, and I just mentioned a while back that pancreatic cancer, I mean, I, you know, it seems like it's a systemic disease. Uh, EUS, FNA, and MRI are both very sensitive and specific, but they're expensive, in the op especially in the case of EUS, it's operator dependent. And it's only justified for screening a high risk population. And that's fine, but most of the patients with pancreatic cancer are not. They don't comprise the high, they don't come from high risk, uh, they're not part of the high risk population. So it's a very small percentage that would be screened anyway, and the vast majority of people won't, would not be screened. Um, so currently, there isn't any good, inexpensive, non invasive screening test that you could apply to the broad population, basically, all of us. So I had the uh, privilege recently at being at a, a meeting, a similar meeting in Boston, and I met uh, Jack Andretti, who at the age of 15 uh, developed a pancreatic screening test, uh, a screening test for pancreatic cancer. He uh, locked himself in his uh, study, and he spent all summer researching about 4,000 different proteins, and he came up with a protein called mesothelin. And then he uh, sent, uh, I think, 200 letters of inquiry to professors all around the country and finally got into a lab at Johns Hopkins. And he won the Intel Prize for, uh, for, for scientific development. And actually, he's come up with this test uh, that potentially can de detect early pancreatic cancer. Early pancreatic cancer expresses this protein called mesothelin. And um, so this simple urine test costs less than a dollar to do. Now, this isn't validated yet. It's not uh, gone through stringent peer review, but it certainly looks very promising. He's uh, actually going on to Stanford next year. So he's, uh, you know, I, I think it's just amazing that somebody, that a high school kid could, uh, could really do this. But, um, you know, I think there's a lot of hope in the future. If we do get an early, I mean, a very inexpensive screening test that could screen the broad population for early cancer, that would be, be wonderful. So this is my own story. So uh, in July 2013, it was a very hot summer. My wife, Melissa, who was 50, was 50 at that time. She was an avid tennis player. She played about four or five times a week, and she's extremely healthy. And she came home one day and mentioned she had dark urine. It was a very hot day, and she just played tennis. And I said, look, I think you're just dehydrated. You need to drink more water. And uh, so the next day, she came back, and she said, you know, I still have dark urine. And then I examined her, and I saw that she was jaundiced. And um, we got some lab work. It was suggestive of bile duct blockage. And um, you know, I'd been dealing with the bile duct, pancreas, and pancreatic cancer for 20 years. So this is something I knew uh, really, you know, I knew intimately. I'd done over 10,000 ERCPs in my career at that point. And uh, I hoped that she had a gallstone. I didn't want to think otherwise, but I was really concerned about her bilirubin level is much higher than what you'd normally see with a gallstone, and her alkaline phosphatase level is very high. And <clears throat> she ultimately went, underwent a CT scan that showed a large mass in the body of the pancreas. It actually had grown into the bile duct and was blocking it off, too. So I had my uh, partner do an endoscopic ultrasound, and she had the final aspiration. This revealed adenocarcinoma, and a stent was also placed in the bile duct at that time. She had hoped you know, that it wasn't going to be adenocarcinoma, that this was going to be a neuroendocrine tumor, but it didn't turn out to be that way. And so she was diagnosed, like a lot of my patients now, with stage 3 disease. So she, had, she didn't have any metastases, or obvious metastases at that time, but she had locally unresectable disease. It was involving the blood vessels. So um, 
it's a pretty small world in therapeutic um, endoscopy, and so I took her to see oncologists and the team at Yale, Johns Hopkins, Columbia, and Sloan Kettering. I spoke uh, to numerous people around the country, uh, sent her scan around to at least half a dozen places, her biopsies to you know experts and colleagues from UCLA, MD Anderson, Seattle, and Wisconsin. But ultimately, uh, <clears throat> yes, dream was pretty standard. This is uh, our family about a year before she uh, she died. My uh, son Chris was 11, Tristan was nine at the time of diagnosis. And uh, this is us in Bermuda. And uh, you know, this is a very difficult time for me for many, many reasons. My wife actually did everything. I, ju I just worked. She took care of the house. She <laughs> Took care of the kids. She cooked. I mean, I you know it was all sort of done. And I, you know, after she passed away, it was very kind of just, things weren't just done anymore. <laughs> um, so we elected to have care at Yale at Smilo facility, and our plan was to try and shrink the tumor, downstage it, and make it resectable. Um, I have to say that Johns Hopkins had a wonderful reputation, but it's a really terrible experience for us. And uh, they um, and I'm not. You know, I don't want to be disparaging about an institution. The very fine institution. We had six patients that morning who had uh, were being evaluated for pancreatic cancer, and they were. I think they discussed everybody over lunchtime, which was I think 10 minutes per patient, and and then we met with uh, the rest of the team that afternoon, and we met with the surgeon, and this was about a week or two after diagnosis, and um, he turned around and said, "This tumor is not resectable." It's never going to shrink down. It's never going to be resectable. This is you're basically terminal, and you know, she bursts into tears. I mean, this is sort of a. Um, and there are many ways to say something like that, and you don't. I think removing hope—that's just kind of taught me—is really kind of a terrible thing to do from uh, in a patient with pancreatic cancer. Anyway, we, we, our plan was to shrink the tumor and make it resectable. <clears throat> so she was started on Fulfurinox. And she initially tolerated this regimen very well. The tumor was stable for months. She did suffer, though, with the bad peripheral neuropathy and out down the road with more chemotherapy and more complications. Uh, she had numerous infections requiring urgent stent changes. And we would go away for the weekend, and then her stent would block, and she'd have a fever, and she'd have chills. She'd feel terrible. We'd have to take her to the hospital. You know, I have changed hundreds, maybe thousands of stents in my life. And I, to me, it's not a big deal. It takes about half an hour, and it's very easy to do. But I never really saw it from the patient's perspective. I never saw, you know, I never realized how much of a hassle it was, how, how disruptive it was to patients and their families that have to come to the hospital and get admitted. Usually, inevitably, happen in the middle of the night. That go to the emergency room. Uh, to me, it was you come into the lab and you change the stent, and it's, you know, why? It's, well, what's the fuss? Um, anyway, so that um, that was really kind of a, a real lesson and eye opener for me. Um, her CT scans remained stable, but there wasn't any shrinkage of tumor. And about 15 months after her diagnosis, she was treated with radiation. Uh, she didn't do well with this, and the next scan that she had revealed progression of the tumor. And then she developed ascites, and we had to get that drain. And she was started on gemcitabine and abraxane, and did poorly on this chemotherapy with bone marrow suppression. Uh, surprisingly, she never lost her hair until she went on a Braxton, and then she lost all her hair, and that was very, uh, she had beautiful hair, and she was very proud of her hair, so this was kind of a you know, big, um, it was very kind of bad for her self-esteem. So eventually stopped treatment, she had home hospice and passed away on April 30th, 2013, 21 months later, after 20 months, 21 months following diagnosis, and about two months shy of our 25th wedding anniversary. So as a provider, this experience sort of taught me a lot. It underscored the importance and value of being kind to patients and families, spending some time. And really, I mean, you know, a kind word went, went a very long way. And even with my background and resources, I mean, I lived pancreatic cancer for years. I mean, this is what I, what I do, and I was a go-to person in the, in the state for this. Uh, but just, and, and I have to say, the, you know, the nurses that I came across for the most part were wonderful. And the oncologists were fine. They were a little, and we have an oncologist in the audience. I mean, they, they do. Um, so it's okay. I, <laughs> <laughs> 
you know, I mean, they're busy. They probably can't get over-involved with their patients. There's just too many of them, and, and it's, it's, they're, they're not generally sort of touchy-feely. <laughs> they tend to be a little, you know, there's a little distance there. And, and the oncologist was a friend of mine. So, but, so um, the nurses were just were, were, were wonderful. And small things are a big, big deal to patients and their families, you know, just stopping and talking to you for a few minutes and saying, how are you doing? And how are the kids? And how's, you know. Uh, and it's just, it's really important not to take away the hope, to, to take, take away hope. And uh, my wife with her two, two young kids really cling to every, every glimmer, every little bit of hope that was available. Uh, if possible, you know, one of the nice things about Yale, uh, what they did right was a, for cancer patients, they got directly admitted to the hospital for the most part. I mean, rarely you'd have to go through the emergency room. And it was, um, if you did go to the emergency room, you know, typically it's like any other emergency room. It takes several hours. It's, it's, it's really disruptive. It's, it's a hassle. And, you know, it's just much kinder if you can just be admitted directly into the, in, into the hospital. Uh, again, I can't say enough about our oncology nurses. We actually ended, we ended up having one nurse assigned to Melissa who basically was responsible for chemotherapy. Um, they also had another wonderful program at Yale called PACT, Parenting at Challenging Times. And we met with uh, people from the program and they basically gave us advice on how to really deal with the kids. You know, what do you tell the kids? You tell them everything? Do you, you know, I mean, how, how involved should they be? And that was, that was extremely helpful, at least to, to both of us. And my advice for patients and families dealing with this is, you know, be well informed about options available, including clinical trials. Um, important that surgery and endoscopy need to be done by an experienced team. We're fortunate here to have one of the best teams in the country. And really, this, 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 you know, you need to have somebody who's done a lot of surgeries, and you need to have somebody who's done a lot of endoscopy um, um, to really take care, to take the best care of you. Uh, make sure you get enough support and attention from an oncology team, and if you don't, change it. Um, and again, try and try and avoid the emergency room. Also, there is a time to stop treatment. We probably went went on too far. I mean, they're really as hard as it is. It's it's it's. You know, we, you need to accept reality at some point. And then important to get your things in order when you're well, early on in your illness. And, you know, we didn't do that. My wife died without a will. And, uh, yeah, we, um, she took a turn suddenly for the worse. And we never really, she never really wanted to accept this. So we never really discussed it. And it kind of, we didn't have closure and left sort of a lot of questions at the end. And this is, this is another challenge to deal with. So I, again, in summary, the last uh, pancreatic cancer is devastating diagnosed with patients and their families, and high-risk patients have opportunities to become advocates of their health. Uh, innovations in early detection of pancreatic cancer need to happen and develop further. So thanks very much.